Yes, right. So uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us this evening. I'm Tom Putnam, the director of the Concord Museum. We're so pleased to launch the museum's celebration of National Poetry Month with this reading and conversation with Gail Mazur and to mark the publication of her new book, Land's End, New and Selected Poem, in which two of Concord's own, Emerson and Thoreau, make cameo appearances. In addition to being an award-winning poet, Gail Mazur is the founder of the Blacksmith House Poetry Reading Series, one of the oldest continuous series in the country. She's taught widely, including at graduate writing programs at Boston University, Emerson College, where she was a colleague of tonight's moderator, and the University of Houston, and has also taught in the summer session of the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown. I spent a portion of my weekend savoring the poems in this new collection, which is graced with a lovely oil painting of her late husband, Michael. In a 2006 interview in the Atlantic Magazine, Gail remarked, quote, the intersplicing of humor and heartbreak is essential to expressing anything real. Or as she writes in a recent poem in this new collection in which we find her purchasing turnips from a roadside stand in Easton and then bringing them home to quote, make the bitter delicious. We're honored to have Megan Marshall as our moderator this evening. I smiled in reading her official biography, which notes that she lives in Belmont, midway between Boston and Concord, locations that figure prominently in her subject's lives. Megan won the Pulitzer Prize in Biography for her book, Margaret Fuller, A New American, the Frances Parkman Prize for her book, The Peabody Sisters, The Woman Who Ignited American Ro Romanticism, and rave reviews for her biography and memoir, Elizabeth Bishop, A Miracle for Breakfast. So we will begin this evening with Megan having a few uh, conversation with Gail, and then Gail will read a few poems, uh, and afterwards they'll have a additional conversation. And then I'll come back on and share some questions or comments that you can add uh, in the chat feature um, on the YouTube on our YouTube channel. Uh, so with that, I'll turn things over uh, to Megan Marshall. Thank you so much, Tom, and, and thanks, Gail, for inviting me to share this celebration of your wonderful new book with you. Um, I'm really just going to begin by talking a bit about how Gail and I know each other and, and um, some of the most, um, I don't know, valuable aspects of my long friendship with Gail. Um, we met at a, some kind of writer's gathering in probably the late 1980s when I was beginning work on the Peabody Sisters. And um, that was a project that took me two decades. And uh, I was always kind of nervous about describing it to anyone. And it seemed very obscure, but Gail knew right away who the Peabody Sisters were and was very excited. And, and um, she's always been a supporter of me from that time, one of the people who believed I might actually finish that book. So I, I wanna just, you know, express my gratitude for that. But aside from the kind of individual support that she would offer when we saw each other now and then, um, as a, um, I hate to, hate to say the word role model of someone who I feel so close to, but, but that was very true that Gail was someone who was a writer and a mother and a writer and a teacher and a writer uh, who also gathered and formed and cultivated a community of writers through the Blacksmith House Poetry Readings. And um, just a great example of how to live a life as a writer, but above all, a writer at the heart of everything, a writer and a creative person. And in reading her poems, I often think of um, an aim that Elizabeth Bishop described in what she wanted to accomplish in writing a poem. She said a poem should convey the effect of being in action within itself. And I think Gail's poems mm -hmm. all have that quality of, of movement and of uh, movement of thought and realization. Um, we taught for many years together at Emerson College, which if you don't know, is not named for Ralph Waldo Emerson, but for a younger cousin who was an elocutionist, also a Unitarian minister, Charles Wesley Emerson. But I just wanna end with a little anecdote that Gail knows part of this, but not the whole of it. Um, 
we were fortunate to have our books be chosen as national, uh, national Massachusetts, Massachusetts Book Award winners in 2006. Um, my uh, Peabody sisters and Gail's Zeppo's wife, first wife, sorry. Um, and, um, uh, and the celebration for this was out in Lenox, Massachusetts. And I decided I would drive out there with my then 16 year old daughter who was um, having sort of a rough patch. I didn't want to leave her alone all day to drive all the way to Lenox and back. And her class in, in American literature was reading uh, The Scarlet Letter. And I made this big effort to get uh, that book on tape, I guess those days, you know, you, you can't hear these things on an iPod in 2006. So um, we were listening to the Scarlet Letter as we drove out to Lenox, which seemed very appropriate. And um, I don't know if my daughter was all that interested in this event, um, but she was very interested in the reading that Gail gave and Gail, bless her soul, spent a lot of time just chatting with my daughter being uh, you know, showing that she was more than a writer intent on collecting her prize. She was a real person and a kind, uh, interested friend to my daughter. So as Christmas fell after this, um, I decided to give to each of my daughters, the one who was then 16 and another 22, a copy of one of Gail's poems rolled up in a little scroll and tied with a bow inside their Christmas stockings, which I still gave them. And and the poem that I gave to them is the one that I think she's going to read first when she starts um, on this plan here, on this plan of reading. So I will now hand over the microphone, the virtual microphone podium to Gail to begin her reading, which I'm looking forward to so much. Thank you so much, Megan. I, I actually didn't remember didn't remember, I, I remembered our being together and you being there with your daughter, but uh, being a mother, it probably just was second nature to me to talk to her. Mm -hmm. And she was a joy to talk to. Um, and thank you for that fantastic introduction. We do go back a long way, don't we? We, we were lucky. Um, so I, the first poem I'm going to read, which I believe I told you, so I hope the narrative is unbroken, is Young Apple Tree. Okay, good. Um, this, this poem, Young Apple Tree December, can I be heard? Somebody tell me if I can't. Um, was actually written to celebrate the planting of an apple tree in honor of Florence Ladd, who had been the director of the, um, Radcliffe in the Bunting Institute. And I was asked to write, to write a, a poem for the event. And I, I just couldn't think of what to do with an apple tree. And I said to my husband, Michael, say one thing to me about a tree. And he said, when they, as they grow, they constantly seek balance, you know, which was about the, obviously about the branches. And I went out for a walk and I came home and this is the one time this ever happened, the poem was written. It was just, you know, just the, just the shove that I needed. So um, I, I don't think that it needs any other explanation. It's, it, it is what it is. Young Apple Tree, December. What you want for it, what you want for a child, that she take hold, that her roots find home in stony winter soil, that she takes seasons in stride, seasons that shape and reshape her, that like a dancer's, her limbs grow pliant, graceful, and surprising, that she know in her branchings to seek balance, that she know when to flower, when to wait for the returns, that she turn to a giving sun, that she know to share fruit as it ripens, that what's lost to her will be replaced, that early summer afternoons a full blossoming tree, she cast lacy shadows, 
that change not frighten her, rather change meet her embrace. That remembering her small history, she find her place in an orchard, that she be her own orchard, that she outlast you, that she prepare for the hungry world, the fallen world, the loony world, something shapely, useful, new, delicious. The, um, the next poem I'm going to read is an ode to the Charles River, which I actually grew up on in Auburndale, Massachusetts. And um, we, we grew up on a cove that, that at that point we could swim in. It wasn't, it, it, it was about to become very polluted. And then ultimately, long after I moved away there, I make a reference to a governor, Governor Dukakis had a project to clean to have to clean the, the uh, Charles River, which he did. Um, but it has, so it kind of flowed through my childhood and my family's history since my grandparents, when they came from the old country, had settled in Boston and in Dorchester. Uh, It's an ode, I guess, to the Charles River. Because you flowed through my childhood, because summers I swam freely in your currents, because you froze every winter, metamorphosed to a glazed floor for skating, because I believed you were the first landing place for Leif Erikson, although the world book claimed otherwise. Leif named his new discovery Woodland, and land of flat stones, because you had trees and many flat stones, gray skipping stones. Leaf's men found wild grapes and salmon there, and my father fished from your shore, catching perch and pickerel, and found them delicious to fry in spite of their little bones. Because on the Day of Atonement, my grandfather walked from Dorchester to empty his pockets into you, Casting off lint and crumbs for the year's sins, his good shoes steeped in your waters. Because your dark green trees promised to protect us, because twice I nearly drowned in you, and a neighbor child did drown, small body washed up on your snarled bank. Because my love and I canoed through your toxic years when you'd become reeking and filthy, only mutant fish and water rats swam in you. He'd say there's no great city without a river. And because a governor determined you were worth saving and cleaned you up and made you swimmable again and lively with mallards, grackles, American coots in our warming world, merely paradisial. Because an ocean says eternity and a river says home. Because, dear familiar, I believe I haven't stepped into the same river twice, for other waters always flow into you, and I am always a different person. Because this chilly October, I find devil pods tangled among your river grasses, tough, grotesque little seed pods that look like bats or demons that will always live and thrive in you and in me. When, when uh, the river became polluted, my parents found a way to get to the Cape in the summer at what was then a completely a Wampanoag village in Mashpee and now is like a suburb of, of Boston. But we, we lived um, on a pristine, a pristine lake there in the summers and, and uh, barefoot, barefoot and happy. Nostalgia, translucent golden shells, 
on the, on the cool windowsill, bare feet, calloused soles, a small splinter in the heel of the hand from a rough oar, lake of herring minnows, of snappers, crystalline water we all took for granted, thorns, sunburns, poison ivy, a station wagon before seat belts, its sandy seat burning our thighs, but forgiving summer, everyone there, grandparents who could remember the Cossacks, never talked about the old country, who was being spared, themselves? I know a child is shaped by the unspoken, shaped by what you'll someday need to study to begin to imagine, but those summers, darkness was for easy sleep, cool nights so starry with fireflies and the vast dazzling mythos of the constellations, summers, torn shorts, dripping ice cream cones, the flavors, cantaloupe, blueberry, cranberry, more tart than sweet. Is that my phone? I thought I moved it. Let me go back. Torn shorts, dripping ice cream cones, the flavors, cantaloupe, blueberry, cranberry, more tart than sweet, harvested from the bog at the end of Pimlico Pond Road, where yes, a hummingbird moth flutters in the ghost of the mimosa tree, as if that tree's divine perfume hovers there now, a half century after its removal. And this, this one of my newer poems uh, is, I, is I am sure the only poem in which both Ralph Waldo Emerson and Mike Tyson, the boxer appear, not in the same rink. Is called at 4 a.m. Some people have an appetite for grief, Emerson wrote, and years ago, reading that, I thought, not me. Though I knew what he meant, I'd known people to default to it, people married to woe, dumbfounded by any sort of merriment. Still, I thought our venerable sage judged some people harshly from his conquered manse, where character meant transcending the insane bull he'd known when widowed young, he'd nearly died of grief, of rending rage. Non-negotiable loss, we know some people seem to thrive on it. They can't be coaxed into the light. Lightheartedness won't touch them or delight. It's hum negligible and irritant, a cloud of gnats to brush away. Did lofty Emerson disdain them for frailty of spirit? No, but he was done with it. That first loss tempering him oddly into calm for the losses that would come. The calm that said, grief can teach me nothing. Not me, not now. I know day when it makes me can bring, when it wakes me can bring back endless night. Even here, long uncompanioned or companioned by grief and joy, the he in me, I hunger for laughter, for touch, for tears my hand can brush away. My work now to continue learning to absorb the loss and live. Is that work enough? How can I know who or what can help me learn? I'm a peasant, a humble Mike Tyson said. At one point, I thought life was about acquiring things. Life is totally about losing everything. For a fighter, a violent man, that's knowledge hard earned, whose things are bul bulwark against self-loathing and despair. It's clear he knows now things can't be enough. But I don't care what Tyson knows or don't know why I care. Does his abrasive cleansing knowledge touch me? Yes. Or is it its devastating articulation? Living on here, 
I have what I have, an acceptance of loss that disappears in dreams, in excruciating replays of a life draining away. These visitations like falling trees unsummoned come. My night, a crushing yesterday, the lit bedlight won't erase or wish away. The next poem I'm going to read is called Figures in a Landscape. Um, and it, it was written uh, in the last months of my husband's life, actually. Figures in a Landscape. We were two figures in a landscape in the middle distance in summer. In the foreground, twisty olive trees, a mild wind made the little dry leaves tremble. Then, of course, the horizon, the radiant blue sky. The maker was hungry for light, light silvered leaves, a stream. I like to think for your sake, the scene was Italian, 17th century. Viewed from here, we resembled one another. Though in truth we were unalike and we were tiny, he kept us small so that the painting would be landscape, not anecdote. We were made things, deftly assembled, but beginning to show wear. You, muscular, sculptural, and I was I. We were different. We had a story. On good days we found comedy in that. Pratt Falls, and also great sadness. Sun moved across the sky and lowered until you and I were in shadow, bereft. The Renaissance had ended. We'd long known we were mortal. In shadow, I held the wild daisies and cosmos we'd been gathering for the table. Then the sky behind us pinked and inflamed the landscape where we were left to our own reinvention, two silhouettes who still had places they meant to travel, who were not abstractions. Had you pricked them, they'd have bled, a lizard in crimson. I wanted to walk by myself a while, but I'd always been afraid to lose you. And the naked olive groves were hovering as if to surround you. That was the problem. I craved loneliness. I needed the warmth of love. If no one looks at us, do we or don't we disappear? The landscape would survive without us. When you're in it, it's not landscape. Any more than the horizons, a line you can stand on. Um, when later in our marriage, after we had raised our children, um, Michael, Michael and I began to be able to travel a little. And he had worked and studied in, uh, in Italy when he was 20. And when we went back to Italy, I had never been together. He, I had this little bad translation of great Italian poems. And a terrible translation of this poem written by Michelangelo, who uh, uh, most people don't know, was a poet. In fact, uh, the collection of his poems includes 800 poems. Um, and he was, so he was very serious about his poetry. And uh, this poem is kind of, in a way, it's a riot, but it's also about the desperate uncertainty one has in, in the midst of making sometimes. Sometimes you're not just sure all the way that it's, that it's going to work. And this is called To Giovanni da Pistoia, who was his contemporary painter, when the author was painting the vault of the Sistine Chapel, 1509. And this is a pretty true and close uh, translation, which I'm only saying because it's so surprising for those of us who know Michelangelo for his art and particularly for the 
for the vault of the Sistine Chapel. I've already grown a goiter from this torture, hunched up here like a cat in Lombardy or anywhere else where the stagnant water's poison. My stomach squashed under my chin, my beards pointing at heaven, my brains crushed in a casket, my breasts twist like a harpy's, my brush above me all the time, dribbles paint so my face makes a fine floor for droppings. My haunches are grinding into my guts. My poor ass drains to work as a counterweight. Every gesture I make is blind and aimless. My skin hangs loose below me. My spine's all knotted from folding over itself. I'm bent taut as a Syrian bow. Because I'm stuck like this, my thoughts are crazy perfidious tripe. Anyone shoots badly through a crooked blowpipe. My painting is dead. Defend it for me, Giovanni. Protect my honor. I am not in the right place. I am not a painter. I think that's a familiar feeling that we all have at some stages of doing our work. But um, he was really in torment, but it, it also makes you laugh because he was working on one of the most sublime works of art in, in Western art. I have um, two more poems, one fairly short and one longer. Um, I refer to two artists, Hokusai and Hiroshige, who, um, well, I know you've all heard, know the work of Hokusai um, and of Mount Fuji. Mount Fuji. Hokusai and Hirosuke, my first presents to you, two linen-bound books that closed with loop ribbons and faux ivory clasps. Decades later, we gave it at Fuji from a window of Japan air and gasped together in Narita, a park so immaculate, white rocks gleamed graphic and a river of gravel. Later still, you'd move between the floating worlds of Pupioe woodcuts and Chinese landscapes, whose surfaces entered you as if it had been fated. A draftsman's draftsman, Hokusai at 70, thought he'd begun to grasp the structures of birds and beasts, insects and fish, of the way plants grow. Hoped that by 90, he'd have penetrated to their essential nature and more by 100, I will have reached the stage where every dot, every mark I make will be alive. You always love that resolve you repeat joyfully, Hokusai's utterance of faith and work's possibilities, its reward that at 150, he perhaps have learned to draw. In Edo then, his beloved Fuji was seen as the true source of immortality, as for him it was to be. Will you always give me such spectacular gifts, you asked me that day, that day when we were 20? That poem still makes me smile. And this poem would make me laugh, except I can't can't because I'm reading it. Um, it's called Baseball. Take a deep breath. It's for opening week. And it's the earliest poem in the book. Baseball. The game of baseball is not a metaphor, and I know it's not really life. The chalky green diamond, the lovely dusty brown lanes I see from airplanes multiplying around the cities are only neat playing fields. Their structure is not the frame of history carved out of forest. That is not what I see on my ascent. And down in the stadium, the veteran catcher guiding the young pitcher through the innings, the line of concentration between them 
that delicate filament is not like the way you are helping me, only it reminds me when I strain for analogies, the way a rookie strains for perfection and the veteran in his wisdom seems to promise it, it glows from his upheld glove. And the man in front of me in the grandstand drinking banana daiquiris from a thermos, continuing through a whole dinner to the aromatic cigar, even as our team is shut out, nearly hitless, he is not like the farmer that Auden speaks of in Bruegel's Icarus, or the four inevitable women-hating drunkards yelling, hugging each other, and moving up and down continually for more beer, and the young woman trying to understand what a full count could be to please her husband, happy in his old dreams, or the little boy in the Yankees cap already nodding off to sleep against his father, program and popcorn memories sliding into the future and the old woman from Lincoln, Maine screaming at the Yankee slugger with wounded knees to break his leg. This is not a microcosm, not even a slice of life. And the terrible slumps when the greatest hitter mysteriously goes hitless for weeks or the pitcher's stuff is all junk who threw like a magician all last month or the days when our guys looked like Senate cops, slipping, bumping each other, then suddenly the play that wasn't humanly possible, the kid we know isn't ready for the big leagues, leaps into the air to catch a ball that should have gone downtown, and coming off the field is hugged and bottom slapped by the sudden sorcerers, the winning team. The question of what makes a man slump when his form, his eye, his power, aren't to blame. This isn't like the bad luck that hounds us. And his frustration in the games, not like our deep rage for disappointing ourselves. The ballpark is an artifact, manicured, safe, seen in an Easter egg. And the order of the ball game, the firm structure with the mystery of accidents always contained, not the wild field we wander in, where I'm trying to recite the rules to repeat the statistics of the game and the wind keeps carrying my words away. Seen in an Easter egg is from John Updike's sublime essay on Ted Williams' last game as before he retired from a career with the Red Sox and he called Fenway Park, which a beautiful little band box of a park and seen in an Easter egg. So thank you for listening. Fabulous, Gail. You. you know, I, I'm remembering as you read it, how I got that first book of yours, Nightfire is it called, yeah. uh, 1978 maybe, uh, the year after I graduated from college myself. And I had, um, tried to write a poem about the 1975 World Series game um, games when the Red Sox lost so tragically to the Cincinnati Reds. Oh, um, and I have like these serious questions I will want to ask you, but first I want to ask, was it more fun to root for the Red Sox when they were cursed? Um, what do you think? Well, you know, I grew up with them not winning. Right. I grew up with, with Ted Williams. Ted Williams, my father's store was near Fenway Park, and Ted Williams bought his fishing equipment for my father. So <laughs> that was like, you know, if you're a, an ordinary family living out in Upperdale, and you know somebody, your, your, your father knows somebody famous. I didn't know him. Um, it, it was glory enough that, that we just knew him. And I never, um, I was at the sixth game of that World Series. I, I actually flirted with somebody and he invited me to the game. <laughs> and I was like 15 years into my marriage. <laughs> but it was worth it to get to that game. Yeah, yeah. and it was cold and I was wearing a lot of clothes. <laughs> but, um, I think that it's probably, it's great for a writer to have a team that doesn't lose in a star that you identify with on the team. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think that's, 
that's, um, and, and this was the team that after all sold Babe Ruth away and had never won a World Series after that. You know, so we, we at least we had Ted Williams and it was, that was a wonderful team. I was too young and too much of a girl to really understand baseball then. But by the time I went to the World Series game, and I understood at least what was at stake. I knew what was at stake, everything. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, um, maybe that leads me to my first serious question, which is, um, I think it's a question that writers and maybe particularly poets hate to have asked to them, but I'll try to ask it in a way that, that doesn't annoy you. Um, you know, one of the great discoveries uh, that has been made about Elizabeth Bishop recently is a, a trove of letters where, that she wrote to her psychoanalyst. And in one of them, she writes about going on a bicycle ride to a particular cove. And, and um, in this letter, she says, and I saw the poem, this is, became the poem at the fish houses. And we all, Bishop scholars think it's wonderful that now we know something about what went on in Elizabeth Bishop's head when she knew there was a poem to be written. Um, and I'm wondering whether anything like that happens to you. Do you see a poem or is it words that drift into your head or how do you know there's a poem to be written? There may be something that I hope to have a poem about, but nothing happens unless a phrase comes to me. Not kind of words drifting, not, not, not random words, but um, I, I, I you know, I can't sit down and saying, "Oh, gee, I really want to. I really want to write about hockey." <laughs> you know, I, I never would because I don't like it. But you know, I really want to write about um, the year that some, something happened, um, and then you know, wandering and drifting around in my head when. I always think poems really start with words, not with images. So that's so fascinating, you know, that you've lived your most of your adult life with a painter who dealt with images, although also a very articulate man. Um, and, uh, and you have his paintings as covers of your books, but um, was it in some way helpful to have these different spheres? It's not quite right brain and left brain, but words and images divided. Uh, well, it was probably it was probably helpful because I I was an undergraduate when I got married. It was probably helpful that he wasn't a writer because I wasn't yet, you know. And there was no um, I, I, and he was we we were sort of whatever the types are, you know, the sort of. The, the met metabolic types of human beings, we were opposite. You know? <laughs> and it would have been crushing to have him churning out thing for poem after poem. I, I would have had to become a painter. You know? <laughs> you know? So, but on the other hand, I thought, even though we were different in that way, it was simply helpful that both of us loved poetry and art and that um, neither we 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 never seemed foreign to each other from the beginning, even though ne neither of us had known in our lifetime till we were twenty an artist or a poet, hmm. except a teacher. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, but oh. I, I do think it. I do think that being both in the arts. What what's easier? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I mean, I, 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 I never had to explain, I never had to explain myself. Or defend yourself. Yeah. And, and I, and he, he, he wasn't like that, but he didn't have to, if he was like that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, my last question before we maybe take some questions from the audience or from Tom, um, you and, well, Mike grew up in New York City and you, you're a New Englander. You, you ended up settling here in Cambridge and um, you know, many people would say, oh, you're, you have to be in New York to really be a painter, maybe more particularly, but even to be a writer. Um, 
this is a choice of yours to settle here. And I'm wondering what, um, what you gain from New England, from wh what is, what does New England have to give you as a writer? Um, how did it support you in this? You know, I, 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 I the, 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 well, there was a two part question, but the first, since this is about me, yeah. the part of the question wasn't what did Mike gain? Mike was a tr true blood New Yorker. I mean, he was a New Yorker. Mm -hmm. um, he actually needed to work here. He, he thought Cambridge was the country. You know? And he really needed to go to New York. He was in New York often. He saw everything that he wanted to see in New York. And, and most people in New York thought he still lived there. Hmm. Although he never lived there after college, except when he, we moved there together for a couple of years. And then he, and he thought he had to live there. And then he, he decided he switched art galleries and came back here. But I think, I can only think of it since, since I didn't have a desire to live else, elsewhere um, or, or to live here. I mean, I was a, in college when I got married in New England. So um, you can see those are New England poems. You know, I don't mean for them to be, but I feel comfortable with the history I, I grew up in, mm -hmm. you know, and the, then the complex history, you know, the history of family and history of part immigrant family and part not. And, and, um, and um, when I, when Mike was teaching in RISD and we lived in Providence, he go to Guggenheim and we moved here. And my friend Elsa Dorfman, who died like last year, um, took me to the girl year the first week I was here. You couldn't have pulled me away from Cambridge after that. <laughs> you know, because I it wasn't they weren't even it wasn't that there were people hanging out. There was this room was all poetry and the owner didn't seem to be trying to sell it you know I mean it was just people were sort of coming in and gossiping about poetry and it, it was no nobody that I met there had ever published a book until Lowell came in one day you know that and that was a thrill of, of its own but um I, I, there are people who who don't need that I, I think, and also because I had two children by the time I was 23, you know, I sort of, I, 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 it, it wasn't, I, I couldn't just step into the world of literature, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I did step into it just by living here. So it gave you subject matter and a community and you helped build this community. Too. I, I think also responding to what you say about Mike needing to leave New York, I, I've been lucky to have a few fellowships that let me spend, a, you know, a year in New York City. Oh, and I, I felt myself being kind of drawn into this. New York is, you know, it's the only place. It's the only place that determines value, and only we are valuable, and only our thoughts are important. And and um, I think there's something, you know, coming back here and being here that you know, it's almost like the transcendentalists in a way, you can set your own standard, try to meet your own standard, and then maybe some higher standard that isn't New York, that's wherever it is, the overthrow. <laughs> I think both you and I have a bit of New York in us and it's, and it's attractive and we like it. And we, you know, it's, it's sharp, <laughs> it's tough. I mean, it's really true, it's tougher. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I find so sort of funny is that my writer friends in New York really don't believe there is another place. Right. And right. that doesn't bother me. <laughs> you know <laughs> better though. I think New York is great. But um, I think this has been a great place for us mm -hmm. to, to work at our own pace for one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, your first book and my first book, I don't remember how old you were, you don't have to say, but I was 40. Mm -hmm. 
you know, and, and I, I didn't even know I was ever going to have, I didn't even think, I didn't think about whether I was going to have a book. In fact, I, I met David Godin at something and he said, do you have a manuscript? And I thought, uh, no, but let me go home and check. <laughs> So, Tom, do we have some questions that we you do? Um, well, first, uh, thank you, Gail. And there were a number of comments just um, from viewers who so appreciated hearing the poem and commented on individual poems. And here's just one um, who wrote, how sweet it is to hear your voice reading these poems, much different than the voice in my head. Um, and I wonder, I once had an interesting experience where I introduced Billy Collins and I found out that he doesn't like hearing other people reading his poems, that he likes to, you know, not, not that he's controlling, but just, you know, there's a certain inflection. I wonder, do you appreciate hearing other people read your poems or do you prefer to do the, you know, the way you read them yourself? Well, the, the, the only people I don't mind, I, I just, I have a, a new poem that I wasn't, about it's kind of sassy and it's set in Mount Auburn Cemetery. <laughs> um, 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 and I, I, some of you may have seen Robert Pinsky's poem in, that's set in Mount Auburn Cemetery in the New Yorker last week. It's a wonderful poem. Um, and I think I hadn't shown him mine because I never was sure about it. And I sent it to him and he, this has never happened before, he called me and read it to me. Oh. And if you've heard him read, you know, he's a great reader. I wouldn't want anybody reading my poem to me, but I was spellbound. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so I don't know, it, it doesn't happen. I mean, people don't read my poems to me. Mm -hmm. So that I'm cool with that. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, another question that, I mean, you share some very private moments in your poems and also some of your relationships with others. And um, I could just maybe comment on, is that a difficult thing to do? How much thought goes into is this, you know, too private of a thing to share? Well, it's, it's a really interesting question because if I write something that's very private and it sounds like conversation, it's too, it doesn't work. It, if, I, if it comes to me with images and metaphors and a landscape and, you know, if I can just make, it's like the Mount Fuji poem, you know, which really about remembering remembering giving Michael those books before we were married, I, you know, that they were pretty, they had clasps, what, I didn't know anything. And, and he said that, and, and after he died, I thought, you know, maybe three, four years after he died, I, I just remembered it and I, and I wanted to describe the books and I wanted to, you know, I want everything, everything in that poem for, it, to my mind is descriptive, you know, but what's moving is more what Hokusai said because it's both sort of funny and enchanting, you know, that maybe at 120 I'll have learned to draw. You know, I mean, it, it, nobody gets to 120. Um, <laughs> so, so I, I mean, I'm not terribly deliberate. I wish I were. I mean, I don't have a really good work schedule habit or stuff. So if I if something that I want to that I want to write is really very personal, I can't. I don't even think of writing it unless some image comes to my mind. You know, that is that is an image that is objective. You know and that I find who carry it. I mean, you know, I, 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 if it doesn't, I can't, I don't have anything to work with because I, I'm, it's not like I'm asking for sympathy. You know, I don't want to ask for sympathy when I write a poem or, or 
or or or think I'm the only person in the world who's ever grieved, you know, or had a mean mother, or you know. <laughs> and um, Megan, I thought it might be interesting. You you dappled in memoir and your book on Elizabeth Bishop. But what was it like to put yourself in a book when you're usually the biographer yeah. standing apart? Thanks, Thanks for asking. Really um, you know, um, I guess I, um, it was a tricky situation because I didn't, because I had known Elizabeth Bishop, I didn't feel I could write about her honestly without somehow um, outing myself. Um, and so I devised this idea of a, the kind of parallel narratives. And I luckily did have a bit of a story to tell involving her and my connection with her that was not entirely positive. Um, it was actually very um, meaningful to me to go back to the, that time, the sort of the roots of my own self as a writer, you know, I had wanted to be a poet. And I always would say that, um, that it was the poetry workshops and learning to look at every word in the poem and make it work that um, enabled me to become a writer at all. I didn't go on as a poet, but um, it was very, uh, you know, helpful to sort of lay it out there and examine the early hurts that, you know, sent me away from poetry, but realized that I had gone on and done something else that perhaps if Elizabeth Bishop had lived, you know, she would have, she would have approved. There would have been some kind of rapprochement perhaps. <laughs> um, maybe she'd have liked my books. I don't know if she'd have liked this book, but um, uh, the other books, I think perhaps. And, um, you know, it was also really interesting to jump from writing about the 19th century where all my subjects were, you know, no longer living and, and uh, um, it took me a long time to realize, uh, aside from the fact that I had known Elizabeth Bishop and there were other people I had known for a while who had been friends of Elizabeth Bishop that I was interviewing, I've, I forgot that I might be able to, you know, find other people and talk to them and interview them. <laughs> um, I preferred to deal with her letters and manuscripts and journals and that sort of thing. Um, well, you, you, had, you had also, it's not different from what I'm talking about, the you had so much meat mm -hmm. to put in there, and and you and you loved the meat. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you weren't a vegetarian. You <laughs> loved the meat, and then and then you had this sort of contrasting story, mm -hmm. of, which is completely surprising when the reader comes to it. Really, thank uh, you. And it's 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 completely original. Mm -hmm. But I did find, and I tell my students this, that writing the uh, memoirish sections was so much easier than writing the biographical ones because, you know, I had to get everything right in the biographical sections. I wasn't <laughs> writing from my memory. So I would spend, you know, just tear my hair out writing these long, the biographical ones and then come to my own little thing and it would just sort of come out. And it, it made me feel a little less sympathetic to my students who were writing memoirs. I think, you know, why just just write it out. Uh, but in truth, these were many of them were stories I had been kind of telling, at least in my head, um, for some time. So I think it, it is helpful to write memoir from a perspective of years. So, so Gail, one um, viewer commented that your baseball poem hits the sweet spot of the bat. Uh, and another said that uh, she was going to send the baseball poem to her father. Oh, so, so that's great. Uh, Wait for Father's Day. <laughs> uh, so one, uh, my, my son said, it's, it's going to replace take me out to the ball game, mom. <laughs> <laughs> and he knows it's not. Either. <laughs> uh, one questioner asked, do you go to certain places to be inspired to write your poems? Yeah, my office, <laughs> where nobody can, nobody can mess with me. <laughs> <laughs> and another says, you often mention fruit in your poems, or maybe in apples, blueberries, olives. And um, the question just wondered whether these memory, do these fruits conjure up certain memories for you? 
I never thought of that. Hmm. Did I have olives in there too? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, I mean, I, but, but food is, for, you know, is the kind of particular that, that, that would interest me if it, if it worked in a poem. You know, if, if, if I were, if I were writing about eating with somebody, you know, I wouldn't want to just say it was the meal was delicious, you know. <laughs> um, no, I think, you know, who was it that said, some writer said, somebody said to him, oh, it was Degas and Valerie. Degas said to Valerie, Oh, Paul, I have so many ideas for poems. And Valerie said, and, uh, poems don't begin with ideas. They begin with things, words. <laughs> so yeah, if I have an idea, it's, I, I, it gets shoved back until some image pushes, pushes it back forward and the image can come with it. It's, I'm, once I get started, I might only need one interesting word to get me rolling. Speaking of the apple, though, the wonderful ending of that poem, The Young Apple Tree, did you see that coming? It ends with the word delicious, which, of course, is the name of an apple. Well, I, I didn't see it coming because, because I was so struck by the fact that my husband had said this you know, a tree, you know, I was so desperate because of that tree, Florence Ladd, tree, Florence Ladd, I don't know what to do, you know. Um, and then when, when he, when he, when, what, without thinking, he was participating in a, in my process in the poem, and he said that, that as they grow, they seek balance. And I, then, then probably what came to my mind was, Branches, branches, I mean, branches in a bowl, you know. I just, I just needed some concrete words to carry all the feeling. And, and of course, of all the name, I, I chose delicious because, because it's a word, special word, you know. I mean, if I'd said crab, <laughs> no, didn't you just say you wouldn't say the meal was delicious, but the apple was delicious. <laughs> it's a very different delicious when it's in that context. Right. It was a brilliant delicious. And I and I didn't I didn't use an uppercase D in the poem because I because I was I was pretending mm -hmm. To, that it was double meaning. I mean, double source of meaning. Sure. Yeah, two meanings in the dictionary. But um, it, I, I know that I have writer, friend, poet friends I admire who are much more able to be deliberate in their work habits than I am. But I feel like I, I was so lucky to back into, to back into writing poems. And you know, then when I look back, I, something I said when I was 20, or I thought, you wanted to be a poet, you just didn't know it. <laughs> no? it, just, it was, it, and that, I, you, I, was, I was just waiting for Elsa Dorfman to walk me into the Grolier, which I had never heard of. Mm -hmm. But my life was waiting for that because I do believe that although makers have to work alone, we love company, you know, in our, in our work. We love company for our work. So something like this evening is really great for me. Thank you. Well, I think that's a lovely way to end. Um...
So I want to thank everyone for joining us uh, this evening. Uh, we'll actually give a copy of uh, Gail's book to one of you who wrote a question or sent a comment uh, chosen uh, randomly after this program. And uh, Gail Mazur, we want to thank you so much for this new collection of poems and for sharing a selection this evening and Megan for guiding our conversation. Uh, it was just a wonderful way to spend the spring evening. Thank oh, you so thank, much. Thank you so much. And thank you, dear Megan, for many things over many years. And thank you, Concord Museum. Yes, and thank all our viewers for coming. Yeah. Good night. I